I'm pleased to open this second panel of two today on the subject of international, an international compensation mechanism and its elements. And we're joined today by, we have four panelists again, Ms. Irina Mudra, the Deputy Minister of Justice of Ukraine, Ms. Alexandra Matvichuk, a Ukrainian human rights lawyer and civil society leader, head of the Center for Civil Liberties, and indeed the no Nobel Peace Laureate for 2022. It's a great honor to have all the panelists here, but it's always an honor to have a Nobel Laureate. We have Mr. Gunter Schirmer, head of the Department of Legal Affairs and Human Rights, the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, the Council of Europe. And online, we're going to be joined from down under again by Dr. Anton Mozienko, who's a lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law. Uh, each of the speakers will speak for between five and seven minutes. We had a bit more flexibility in the first panel, but we're limited to an hour for this one. So I do ask uh, speakers to stick to the five to seven minutes, please, and then we'll go to Q&A with the audience, just exactly as Declan did last time. If you want to give a question from the floor, just raise your hand. And if you have a question for online, please put it through the Q&A function on Zoom. I do have to inform you that Ms. Serena Mudra is coming, but is running late. Anyone who's tried to travel in Europe over the past couple of weeks will appreciate that that isn't unusual now. So she's on her way from Dublin Airport and she's in good hands. So uh, if everyone could just bear with, um, the minister will be with us in due course. So without further ado, I'm going to ask you, Alexander, to go first, if that's okay. Um, so I'll give a, a slightly elongated, um, a slightly extended biography for yourself. Alexandra is a human rights defender who works in Ukraine and across the OSCE region. Ms. Matvichuk heads the Center for Civil Liberties Human Rights Organization in Ukraine and coordinates the work of the Euromaidan SOS grassroots civil society organization. Ms. Matvichuk has vast experience of organizing human rights activities against attacks on rights and freedoms and years of experience of documenting viola violations during armed conflict. Alexander is the author of a number of reports in various international bodies, including for the UN, Council of Europe, European Union, OSCE, the International Criminal Court, and I could go on, but I won't because your time starts now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for providing me the floor. It's a huge honor for me to address to this distinguished audience. I'm a human rights lawyer, and I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. But at present, I and other Ukrainian human rights colleagues are doing our job in the circumstances when the law doesn't work. Russian troops deliberately shelling residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage federation camp system, organize forcible deportations, commit murders, tortures, rape, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. And the entire international system of peace and security can't stop such Russian atrocities. I said that the law doesn't work, but I do believe that it's temporary, that we have to do everything which we can in order to restore international order and demonstrate justice. And because I work directly with victims affected by this war, I know that people perceive justice very differently. For some people, justice means to see their perpetrators under the bars. For another people, justice means to get compensation. So without this, they will feel unsatisfied. For other people, justice means to know the truth, what happened with their beloved ones. And for other people, justice means the possibility to be heard and to get official recognition that something which happened with their beloved one is not just immoral, but illegal. And I do believe that we have proposed the complex justice strategy to satisfy all these needs. And I'm here to present the complex vision of civil society of Ukraine to international compensation mechanism and its elements. Um, we believe that the right holder of the rights of, to compensation is a state victim of armed aggression. And we know that rights to compensation aims to guarantee its security, contribute to the restoration of international legal order, and minimize the threats of revanchism. And from this perspective, the confiscation 
and repurposing of frozen assets is, in our opinion, a component of Ukrainians' rights to self-defense, which is not limited to use of military force, but also extend to economic countermeasures. Also, the main responsibility for compensations lies with Russian Federation as a state that launched an aggressive war, the circle of parties whose actions fall under the definition of the crime of aggression in accordance of the UN General Assembly resolution of 40 December 1974 is broader and includes, but it's not limited to the Republic of Belarus. And we believe that when creating this framework of the compensation mechanism, it should be assumed that a group of aggressor states led by Russia will refuse to pay ex gratia comp compensation. And that is why we emphasize the need to consolidate efforts to support solutions such as civil society mentioned. You can find this document. They conclude, include 12 recommendation from civil society of Ukraine, how this international compensation mechanism has looks like. I only mentioned several because of the shortage of the time. First, it should be recognized that the Russian Federation and other states involved in the aggression against Ukraine should bear absolute responsibility for all damage caused since the occupation of Crimean Peninsula in late February Early, early March 2014. Second, a unified methodology should be used to calculate damages and numbers should be correctly interpreted, distinguish damages from actual recovery needs. Third, it's worth supporting the vision of future international compensation mechanism, which was proposed by the government of Ukraine, which should consist of four elements. The register of damage, the commission of reviewing claims, the fund for making payments, and an international treaty that will establish the provision for the previous three elements to functions. Worse, at each stage of compensation, a victim center approach should be implemented, in particular by ensuring publicity and transparency of decision making wide involvement of representatives of civil society in the establishing and operation of the compensation mechanism and bringing the, the guilty part to justice. And also we want to emphasize that gradual shift of emphasis from the needs of the victims of aggression to the protection of the rights of population of the aggressor state is unacceptable. Ensuring humanitarian needs of Russian population, as well as guaranteeing fundamental rights and freedom, is a responsibility of the Russian Federation and should be provided without any reference to compensation for damage caused as a result of aggression against Ukraine. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much. Um, and we're delighted, fresh off the, the flight, to welcome. Minister Rina Mudra, thank you very much for being with us and for the extra effort it took to be with us. So I'll just introduce you briefly before handing over um, to you immediately. Ms. Rina Mudra is a Ukrainian lawyer and banker who has served as a Deputy Minister for Justice in the government of Prime Minister Denis Schmal since May 2022. A graduate of the University of Lviv, Rina Mudra was previously a lawyer at the State Savings Bank of Ukraine. In the international arena, she is known for publicly promoting the development of a mechanism for sanctions and reparations against the Russian Federation for the war against Ukraine. Thank you for being with us, Minister, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for being here today. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome all the distinguished uh, participants of this event. I don't know what was that. Today there was the, the day full of surprises, whether Riga didn't want let me out of the country because we were there in the Justice Minister's conference of the Council of Europe member states, or Dublin didn't want to let me in. But we'll never uh, continue our fight for justice in every place of the world. But first of all, uh, let me to, to express my gratitude to the Institute of International and European Affairs for hospitality. The Department of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, Ireland 
the Ukrainian embassy to Ireland and the um, Ukrainian action for the organization of the this event and the opportunity to participate and to express the position of Ukrainian government in this very important topic on ensuring comprehensive accountability for violations of international order and restoration of justice. Starting from 24th of February 2022, Ukraine is facing with the most serious challenge since achieving independence in 19. 91. The ongoing war has already resulted is in significant human loss, unprecedented damages and losses, displacement and devastating destruction of infrastructure. And this is without taking into account the horrific consequences of war crimes. Just look at these statistics. More than 100,000 war crimes registered by law enforcement bodies in Ukraine. Among them, more than 3,115 crimes against children. 11,000 civilians killed or died, including 503 children. More than 17,000 civilians wounded, including more than 1,100 children. Almost 20,000 children were forcibly displaced and deported. 1,122 are considered to be missing. 231 registered facts of sexual violence, among them dozens against children. More than 120,000 objects of civilian infrastructure were destroyed or damaged. Residential buildings, uh, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, universities, um, cultural and religious heritage, energy and uh, communication infrastructure. And li this list can go on and on. The Kiev School of Economics has estimated the damage to Ukraine's infrastructure in April 2023 amounts, um, amounted to $150 billion. And this amount increases all the time. A proper evaluation based on the cost of reconstruction, as well as other damage and losses and harm caused to businesses, will conceivably increase this amount. In March 2023, the World Bank assessed the cost of reconstruction and recovery of Ukrainian infrastructure to one uh, to four hundred eleven billion. So these are horrifying figures. And as Alexandra has mentioned, it should be Russia who should pay for all these damages. For Russia to pay the damages is not only moral and ethical obligation, it's a legal obligation under the international law principles of state responsibility. Russia is obliged to compensate all, uh, all the suffering of Ukrainian citizens, all the economic losses to private and public business to pay for the destruction of private and public in infrastructure and property. Russia's expanded invasion of Ukraine accompanied by its war crimes and crimes against humanity on a scale not seen since World War II the demands decisive actions, decisive response from international community. Thus, the states must invoke the responsibility of Russian Federation by lawful means, such as countermeasures, collective self-defense, and expect it to seek to enforce an existing obligation of Russia to make full reparation for a violation of international law. For more than one year, one year and a half, Western governments strongly condemn Russia's aggression and, and support Ukraine. Uh, everyone agrees that Russia must be held to, to account for all atro atrocities and damage costs. But this is not enough. 
political statements should be transferred into real practical actions. We Ukrainian government know what to do. That's why we proposed the action plan on implementation of 0.7 of peace formula of our president, President Zelensky, which is called restoration of justice. So uh, Ukraine proposes to the to our allies, to the governments of our partner states, this plan uh, to achieve this goal. First, ensuring effective investigation on the national level, international support in strengthening national capacity to investigate and prosecute in international crimes, to oper operationalize victims and witnesses coordination center, to provide technical assistance and expertise to the prosecution service. Promoting investigation and prosecution of international crimes committed in or against Ukraine by third states. Second, securing accountability for the crime of aggression. International support of the International Center for Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression, which was recently uh, launched, established in the Hague, uh, to build a strong case for the crime of aggression. Establishment of an ad hoc special tribunal uh, uh, for the crime of aggression committed by Russian Federation against Ukraine as a response to existing accountability gap for the crime, uh, for this crime. And Ukraine called the partner states the Western governments, and not only Western governments, to, uh, to have the solid support of the uh, special international tribunal, not, not of hybrid time tribunal, but a proper tribunal which can address the issue of immunity of the highest political and legal and uh, military leadership of, of the country. Uh, third, continuing strategic partner partnership with the international justice mechanisms. Undoubtedly, the International Criminal Court has a leading role in ending impunity for international crimes, holding perpetrators accountable and granting redress to victims and survivors. And Ukraine will continue fruitful cooperation with the ICC. It is also important to keep regular dialogue with the Commission on uh, UN Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. And of course, continue cooperation with Eurojust, Europol, uh, and Interpol in cases related to international crimes. Ukraine, when the war began, Ukraine used all available and all possible legal tools and avenues and forums in order to bring Russia to responsibility. We launched the case before the European Court of Human Rights. It's the biggest case in, in the history of ECHR, Ukraine versus Russia. To this case, 26 states uh, made intervention into this case. It's unprecedented. We also have a case in ICJ, where also 32 states intervened, and uh, we, soon, we, we will soon have a hearing in The Hague on, on this case. But unfortunately, none of the existing legal mechanisms can be invoked to receive effective compensation of the damages caused as the result of, of this war. And here, Ukraine also made a proposal to our partners. So we proposed the comprehensive compensation mechanism. It won't be a judicial body, judiciary body. It will be an administrative mechanism, which will, which is supposed to to ensure the compensation to the very not only to the state, but to the very victims of the war of aggression. Because if we uh, look into the history and and and. Uh, 
see how reparations were paid. Reparations were paid to the state, not to the victims. There were a few cases when the victims, like victims of Holocaust or uh, war prisoners, received some compensation. But the scale of damages, loss, and injury, which which is caused to Ukrainian people and, and Ukrainian business and the state has not been seen since since World War II. That's why we suggested the this compensation mechanism. Uh, this compensation mechanism, I have to say that it was supported, I would say, by uh, the global community through the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, which was taken in November 14th, 2022. Uh, and it caused furtherance on remedy and reparations uh, for aggression against Ukraine. So this resolution uh, speaks about three main, main provisions. First, that it should be Russia who, who bears this uh, duty, legal duty to make reparations uh, according to international law. Uh, the General Assembly recognized the need of a compensation mechanism or mechanism for reparations for damage, loss, and injury. And the General Assembly called on member states to uh, create, to establish the International Register of Damage. So after this, uh, uh, when this resolution was, was passed, Ukraine started the uh, very intensive work with our partners in order to implement this resolution. And as of today, we have the first but very important step already launched. It's the International Register of Damage, which, which is hosted by uh, the Netherlands. Um, the register was created by an enlarged partial agreement uh, under the auspices of Council of Europe. And tomorrow, uh, yesterday, there was the second meeting of the conference of participants of uh, this register, and it is expected that the register will be fully operationalized and functioning uh, early next year. So what is this register? The register is the database for collecting all the information and evidences on the damage, loss, and injury. So we have to be sure that all this information is properly preserved, collected, and, and, and uh, uh, saved until the proper mechanism is uh, established. Unfortunately, neither Council of Europe by, by enlarged partial agreement nor the register itself can, can create the mechanism able to adjudicate claims. Uh, that is why there should be a solid legal ground for creating the, the, the mechanism and adjudicating claims without the consent of Russia, because we understand that so, well, at least in the, in the visible future, we will not get this consent. That is why our call to international community is to take the measures in accordance with international law to uh, force Russia to, to fulfill its uh, international ob obligations to make reparations through creating the mechanism and through getting access to its assets. Minister, so if you could wrap assets. open about a minute, if that's okay. Sorry? If you could wrap up inside right. a minute, that would be okay. great. So, and so that is why this comprehensive uh, mechanism, it includes register, compensation mechanism, and compensation fund. The last but not the least is the uh, the source for funding for filling mm -hmm. in the compensation fund, and this should be Russian assets in in the first turn, uh, because uh, the the there is a state which made the, the aggression, and the state should sh should bear its responsibility. Thank you, Thank you very much, Minister. Extremely evocative and, and loads to come back to with the first two speakers. But our next speaker, third of four, and I see Anton on stage there, on screen there. Hello, Anton. But before we hear from Anton, we're going to have Gunter Schirmer, who works at the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly as the head of Department of Legal Affairs and Human Rights since 2016. And Gunter has overseen the uh, secretariats of the Committees on Legal Affairs and Human Rights and an election, the election of judges of the European Court of Human Rights previously 
Gunter was the deputy head of secretariat of the Legal Affairs and Human Rights Committee, and before that, the executive secretary of the Council of Europe Development Bank. Before joining the Council of Europe in 1993, Gunter worked as a civil servant at the German Federal Ministry of Finance and as a judge at the Langerecht in Bonn. In the 1980s, he taught German and comparative law at King's College of London and criminal law and procedure at the University of Passau. Gunter, thanks a million for being with us. Uh, excellencies uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to sit at the same on, at, on the same panel as uh, Minister uh, Mudra, uh, who was also uh, invited to our committee, Legal Affairs and Human Rights, uh, in preparation of uh, the resolution uh, in January this year, uh, where uh, our committee and our assembly strongly supported the three-stage plan uh, for compensation mechanism that the Ukrainian government has laid out and that Ms. Muda has now summed up. Um, it, just allow me a, a small parenthesis. It's also a pleasure to be here. Uh, the first panel was a great pleasure to listen to uh, because uh, the very first international body which proposed uh, an international tribunal, international special tribunal for the crime of aggression was in fact our assembly already in April 2022, after what we call the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It's not the beginning of the war. The war began in 2014 with the illegal occupation of Crimea and uh, uh, the proxy war in the Donbas, where many people were killed, including the shooting down of flight MH17 where uh, many, many innocent civilians died. Uh, so this uh, crime of aggression, the crime of crimes uh, must be uh, dealt with, must be uh, prosecuted uh, for all the good reasons that I heard and I'm already preparing the next report. <laughs> I got some interesting input uh, from the first panel this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, so, uh, I'm very happy we were almost laughed at at first, including by colleagues in the Council of Europe, uh, better lawyers than I, uh, who said this will never fly. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Goliaths will, uh, will stop this. Uh, well, they didn't. Uh, our idea finally flew. It got a lot of support from many, many little ones. And uh, that sometimes works. The Council of Europe is a mini UN in terms of, uh, in, in comparison with the worldwide UN for Europe, where small countries have what some say a disproportionate weight in the voting, in the, in the Committee of Ministers, in the Parliamentary Assembly. And it's therefore uh, in a good position to be a, a, a ringleader of, of uh, the <laughs> rebellion of the small ones against the, the, the big bad uh, guys. Um, so let me come to the to the topic of this panel. <laughs> Sorry for the excursion. Uh, uh, the latest estimate of the World Bank is indeed four hundred eleven billion dollars damage, and under the polluter pays principle or cause of pays principle, it must be up to Russia to pay. Why should Western taxpayers? Here's my old finance ministry beginning of career comes in. Why should Western taxpayers foot the bill, let alone the victims, the Ukrainian people? So uh, after Mrs. Muda's intervention in our committee, we have endorsed, our assembly has endorsed a three-step approach proposed by the Ukrainian government. First, creation of the register of damages, that is done. Um, it is to support, to collect all relevant data and secure the evidence, which is key. Um, all lawyers know uh, you have the best case. Uh, legally speaking, if you don't have the evidence, you lose. Uh, the, uh, Reykjavik summit of the Council of Europe launched uh, the partial agreement. The partial agreement mechanism in the Council of Europe is a very flexible legal mechanism to allow a coalition of the willing, and it turns out there were a lot of willing countries to join uh, an activity uh, with very little uh, bureaucratic hindrance. And uh, so we set up this partial agreement uh, on the proposal also of our assembly. And it is open to any country in the world. It's an open partial, partial agreement, open to any country in the world that wants to show solidarity with Ukraine. 
and the Riga principles, which were adopted, you were there, <laughs> by the justice ministers uh, earlier this week, uh, they go very much in the direction of also what, what uh, Mrs. Matvichuk said, victim-oriented uh, approach, uh, not just state versus state, but victims to be implied, uh, to be implicated from the start, and civil society to be involved in the uh, collection of, of uh, data on what happened to individuals, not just the state, the state too. The state has suffered enormous losses, local authorities, regional authorities, infrastructures, but individual victims must be in the focus. Uh, the real principles I would really recommend reading, you find them on the internet immediately. I read them this morning on the plane. They are really wonderful. Uh, we could have written them in the parliamentary assembly. <laughs> and I think, I, I hope we have inspired some of this. Uh, the registry is intended to be replaced in the second step, step by an adju adjudication commission. And here too, the Council of Europe can make an important contribution. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has after all, a lot of experience in allocating compensation to victims of human rights violations. It even has the competence, uh, ration de temporis, to adjudicate all alleged violations which occurred until six months after the expulsion of Russia from the Council of Europe and from the Convention on Human Rights, i.e. 16 September 2022. Uh, I've been to Butcher and Irpin, who was a group of parliamentarians, uh, and just after their liberation from the Russian occupation, and believe me, uh, what happened there will keep the Court of Human Rights busy for quite some time. There are enough cases even for that period until 22nd of September 22. But for violations that occur after the 16th of September, it would still make eminent sense for the future adjudic adjudication commission to make use of the court's methods, methodology, experience, and case law, because it's been established for many decades now uh, how to uh, adjudicate claims in compensation for individual victims <coughs> of human rights violations. So I trust the uh, mechanism when it comes to into being with the help of the UN, with the uh, support of the UN, will continue to benefit from the uh, courts, court of human rights uh, experience. But the third and most difficult step will be how to fill the future compensation fund, which will pay out the damages established by the register and adjudicated by the commission. The parliamentary assembly has already floated some ideas which will surely need further study in terms of their legal basis. Um, frankly, international law as it stands now, with state immunity in particular, may need to be further developed uh, unless a consensual solution can be found with a future new democratic Russia along the lines of the agreement under which Iraq has paid a percentage of their oil revenue until the damage caused by the invasion of Kuwait was paid the last installment, by the way, was in January 2023. But what if Russia refuses, even if we throw into the deal uh, dropping all economic sanctions? Well, we are in Ireland, and the Assembly has recently recommended the Irish model of non-conviction-based confiscation of illegal assets with reversal of the burden of proof to all Council of Europe member states. Uh, Ireland has had great success combating the mafia. It actually moved to the Netherlands, which was the country of my rapporteur for this report, which then introduced the same legislation in the Netherlands. <laughs> um, he was quite shocked when he heard they fled to the Netherlands because they were softer on, on uh, well, criminal assets. Well, in April 22, still under the shock of the Russian invasion, therefore, in, in the mood to go uh, quite far, the assembly adopted a recommendation to use the frozen assets of the Russian oligarchs, at the time about $80 billion, uh, to pay for the reconstruction of, of Ukraine by way of an offset. Russia has a claim against the oligarchs who stole the country's riches, albeit with the illegal and therefore uh, in, invalid authorization of the corrupt regime. And Ukraine has a claim against Russia to pay for its reconstruction. Such an approach would, of course, require some legislation in the countries having frozen uh, Russian assets. 
And as in the Irish model, which was quite successful against the local mafia and has since our report been introduced in quite a number of other Council of Europe member states, basic rule of law principles, namely a legal basis, fair proceedings, possibility of judicial review must be respected. After all, international rule of law is what we stand for and what Ukraine fights for so valiantly on all our behalf. That's the last word. Somebody in the previous panel mentioned the elephant in the room. Uh, one elephant in the room. There's another one. Uh, we, realistically speaking, will need eventually the cooperation of some sort of uh, a future Russian government. And uh, if uh, Russia is not defeated, this will never happen. And uh, therefore, it is first and foremost uh, necessary uh, to give Ukraine the tools to make sure that, or tools, I don't know, why not say it, weapons, to make sure that uh, Russia is defeated and that this regime cannot continue uh, to impose its will on Ukraine and possibly any other neighbors that, that will fall in the, in the uh, firing line of, of uh, what has now become a dictatorship. Uh, we've observed over my 20 years in the Parliamentary Assembly how Russia, which was initially when it joined the Council of Europe, governed by liberals, Democrats, uh, which suffered from seven, $7 oil price and, and Russian population, one generation equates uh, democracy with extreme poverty and misery. Um, they didn't invent the dependency on oil and gas, but when the price was at $7, they couldn't pay the pensions, they couldn't pay the salaries. Then uh, Putin came in, $200 oil price, and then uh, you know what happened. Uh, but then over the years, I was in Chechnya, I was in, in, uh, in many times in Moscow with different rapporteurs, how slowly, slowly at first, and then faster and faster, democracy was dismantled, uh, free speech was literally killed, Kolikovskaya and others, uh, how uh, the, the regime descended into dictatorship. And we know from historical experience, dictatorships become a danger not only for their own people, but also for their neighbors. And that is why uh, the, uh, the real elephant in the room is, can we ever have any dealings with, with, uh, with Russia unless uh, Ukraine wins this war? That's, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Gunter. Hmm? Anton, can you hear me? Is Anton? Uh, the question me? is if you can hear me as well. Yeah, very well. Look, it's it's a pleasure to have you here, and we know it's very very late where you are. So thank you very much for staying up late to be with us. It's appreciated. Uh, Dr. Ans uh, Anton Mazienko is is a lecturer in law at the Australian National University, ANU in Canberra, Australia. His work focuses on issues at the intersection of criminal law and international law, including transnational crime, economic crime, and the legal aspects of targeted sanctions. Anton was previously a research fellow at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, Center, Financial crime, Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies in London. His research at RUSI covered a wide array of financial crime topics, which range from money laundering, techniques used by cyber criminals to crime in free trade zones. He holds a PhD in law from Queen Mary University of London and a master's degree in law from the University of Cambridge. Anton, thanks for being with us. And the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, over the past year and a half, um, quite a lot of my work has focused on the legal and policy dilemmas related to the potential repurposing of frozen Russian assets. And what I wanted to do in these remarks is really to try and navigate this confusion that I have come up against, and I'm sure many others as well, in trying to understand why a number of countries around the world have not yet committed to the idea of repurposing frozen Russian assets for the benefit of Ukraine and specifically for the purposes of providing full reparations to Ukraine. Uh, from listening to the other three speakers of this panel, uh, one might get a very clear idea that in a moral sense, and to some extent in a policy um, sense as well, the idea is a no-brainer. Uh, nobody disputes that Russia owes 
the obligation to make full reparations to Ukraine, and there is the only available significant pool of assets that we currently have in order to discharge that obligation. And that's really the frozen currency reserves that belong to the Russian Central Bank, and to a much lesser extent, the individual holdings of various oligarchs. So what are the sticky points there? What are the current obstacles? Um, I think they can be usefully grouped into three major buckets. First, we've got domestic law, then we have international law, and finally, there is the miscellaneous category of everything else, which is basically policy challenges. You know, would it be a good idea to repurpose frozen assets, even if it's legally available? So if we look first at domestic legislation, obviously the position there varies across countries, but fundamentally uh, the problem is not insurmountable. Parliaments make laws and parliaments amend laws. So unless we run into some insuperable constitutional principle, there's no real obstacle to enabling the confiscation of Russian assets and their transfer to an international uh, compensation mechanism. Um, and there might be potential constitutional issues surrounding the right to property, but this is a right that's typically not absolute in most legal systems and uh, can be modified uh, in the pressing public interest that we clearly see in this situation. So the real battlefield is international law. And we've had references already today to a couple of key doctrines that are really essential to that debate. One of them is the doctrine of countermeasures, and then also potentially the uh, doctrine of collective self-defense, which need not only involve military force, you can have collective self-defense that is of non-military nature. And I think it's really the concept of countermeasures that is key here. Countermeasures are at their essence, a very simple idea. They rest on a notion that you can deviate from your international obligations against another state in a proportionate manner, in a non-punitive manner, if that other state has breached its international obligations. So here the logic would be, given that Russia has committed egregious breaches of international law and owes the obligation to make full reparations to Ukraine, it would be proportionate and it would be non-punitive, it would be restorative to temporarily cease observing Russia's sovereign immunities and enable the confiscation of frozen assets and their transfer to Ukraine. But here we have two basic distinct uh, conceptions of countermeasures that have been offered in expert debate. Some people would argue that it's never permissible to take countermeasures that are permanent in their effect, like confiscation. On that view of countermeasures, it's okay to freeze Russian assets and use that as a bargaining chip for as long as it takes, but it's not okay to actually uh, seize those assets and transfer them over to Ukraine. And fundamentally, there's a legal disagreement there about the interpretation of what the law of state, uh, of law of state responsibility requires and how you interpret the concept of countermeasures. So I'm not proposing to go into too much detail there and get lost in the weeds, but I think there's an eminently plausible legal argument that many people have made in favor of using the doctrine of countermeasures to enable that repurposing of frozen assets. And I think that's by far the better legal uh, position. But there's also this third block of questions that is uh, also vital, uh, potentially, to even a greater extent than the legal side of things, and that's the policy aspect of it. And very often we hear states making objections along the lines of, you know, at least in public, uh, that's what you would you know, read in the press, you know, not being privy to any confidential discussions, but the objections would run along the lines of, okay, well, other countries will worry. Today we confiscate Russian assets, and then tomorrow Western nations will seize the assets of uh, everyone else in the global south, what about the Middle East, what about Africa, what about all the other countries in the world, should they be worried? And I think, you know, fundamentally, there are two schools of thought in dealing with that uh, question. And one of them is to say that maybe we do want to live in a world where potential aggressors or states that are bent on mass human rights violations know that their state-owned property is potentially at stake. If you engage in egregious breaches of international law, you can't rely on the rest of the international community uh, punctiliously observing your sovereign immunities no matter what. 
uh, you do owe the obligation to make reparations to the victims. And you need to understand that in some circumstances, you won't be able to hide behind sovereign immunity. But there was also the other part of that answer, which I think is also important. And that's to highlight just how extraordinary the nature and magnitude of Russia's breaches of international law is. Here we're talking not only about a nation that has violated the fundamental prohibition on the use of force, but also we are talking about mass breaches of international humanitarian law, international human rights law. Uh, we've all seen the footage that Gunther has mentioned of what happened in Butcher and Epin. We're also talking about acting in violation of a provisional measures order that was issued by the International Court of Justice in the case that uh, Ukraine brought, um, and indeed of widespread non-compliance, uh, systemic non-compliance for years with judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. And all of those circumstances um, it can combine to create a pretty unique situation. And so I think you know one can be pretty uh, honest and forthcoming in dealing with those policy-based objections and saying that most other countries in the world, unless they want to follow Russia on the same sort of path of international outlawry, don't really have all that much to worry about in the context of repurposing, um, of the proposed repurposing of Russian sovereign assets. But I think that generally speaking, those are the three key lines along which, along which this discussion has been unfolding and probably will proceed in the near term. And those are the domestic legal aspects in countries involved, um, countries that froze those assets, the international law position, especially as relates to countermeasures, and then the general policy wisdom of, of taking those measures that are you know, unusual and perhaps unprecedented in the sense that they are far reaching, but they're not unprecedented in the sense that there's no a uh, solid legal foundation for them. There certainly is. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. So four excellent interventions. We started a little bit late, so we can run 10 to 15 minutes beyond the time, but I will manage this time very tightly. Um, so the first of three things I would like to do, just to turn to the panelists, perhaps especially Alexander, who went first, but any of the, the panelists, would you like to respond to anything that was said after you, Alexandra, asking you first, seeing as you spoke first and quite briefly? I would like to support the idea that we have uh, to go further and to, um, to think not just about Ukraine, but how to create a good precedent for the whole world. I do believe that countries who violate human rights severely and massively has to know that their assets can be frozen. Um, but if we return to the particular um, topic of discussion, um, I, I maybe will stop on that um, point that I, I welcome the action of some countries who made the audit of Russian assets in their countries, who changed their legislation, and now working together with with the Ukrainian government in consultation, how to repurpose these assets and to use them for reconstruction and rebuilding of my country. Thank you, Alexandra. Minister Mudra, would you like to remark on anything that went after your intervention? Well, I would just say that uh, I'm I'm now more than ever assured after having heard Anton's uh, intervention, that there is a solidarity among the legal community, that they, although we say that international law is not responsive, was not ready to respond to the act of aggression, it is. And there are basis, there are reasons for the states to take the uh, countermeasure and collective self-defense in the form of lifting sovereign immunity, not permanently, mm -hmm. but temporarily until the aggression <laughs> and Russia takes its military out, out of, the, of the state. What we need, so there is a legal solution, and we also propose this legal solution to legal to, to legal advisors, to lawyers of the government. Now what we have to get is the political will. So the, the, the uh, 
we have to work on getting the political will in order to uh, get rid of those uh, of those like frightening things which which Anton has also mentioned with respect to policies that it could be precedent the states other than the western ones could make the same precedent towards other uh, western states but i do uh, agree with with the speaker that those vigorous uh, violations of international order of international law, public right. inter, uh, international humanitarian law, human rights law, those atrocities, the breach of the charter of United Nations, these are the reasons to take collective measures, not in military, um, not mil military actions, but civil, I would mm -hmm. say, and to lift sovereign immunity. Excellent. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm going to briefly, if you could, if you want to respond yeah. to anything Anton said after you. Uh, I'm very impressed with Anton's uh, explanation how international law uh, can justify confiscation or repurposing of uh, state assets. I would like to hear a little more, if, if possible, about uh, how to justify confiscation of uh, and repurposing of the assets of the oligarchs, which are enormous. and. Uh, which uh, we, we attempted in the heat of the April 22 to, to construct a justification with uh, an offset and an assignment of claims, uh, uh, which I, I tried to present. Um, is Very there briefly, if you could go yeah, into the Q&A. Is there any uh, possibility uh, to find a, maybe a stronger- a bit, That's a bit novel, but Anton, if you could give us your 30 seconds on that, then I'll go to the audience. It's, it's, it's a fascinating question. And I think that unlike with state assets, we do have a real rule of law dilemma there, because at the end of the day, we, I think for the most part, accept that we can only confiscate property if it comes from crime. Now, non-conviction based forfeiture, the Irish model, the Italian model, the Georgian model, are, are still examples of confiscating property that derives from crime at the end of the day. And we might make it easier for that to be proven, but one still has to prove it. And I think with a lot of those assets, uh, you know, the crime you know, that might have been committed is so far back that it's simply unfeasible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, realistically speaking, it's still a smaller amount of assets scattered across a number of jurisdictions. And so it would seem to me that the sovereign assets are, you know, the big um, ticket issue there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anton, for your brevity. There's a mic in the room. Dylan has the mic. Excellent. Can I get a show of hands for who might like to ask a question? And I'll say there are some young people as well in the room, which is always nice. And if any young people would like to ask a question, you'll get a privilege. We have Brian, Brian Daly here, please, uh, Dylan, for the first question. And I see Ronan Tyne and anybody else you know, from this side. We'll start at the gentleman in the back. We'll start with Brian. Thank you, Barry, and thanks to all the speakers. Fascinating uh, presentation. This Brian Daly is my name. I'm a member of the Institute here and on the board of the Institute. Um, I can fully understand and understand the rationale and the moral kind of aspect of the debate as to seeking reparations and looking for Russia to, to, to pay. I wonder what the panelists' views would be as to how far one goes in that context. I mean, as, as was said, this is in a scenario where Russia has been defeated. And there is a history of, of, of impoverishing the defeated party, which doesn't necessarily lead to a long-term good outcome um, in history. So if you, we go back in early 20th century. So how far does one go is kind of a question in my mind in seeking reparations and how damaged do you leave the new framework if that's what we end up in, in Russia? And Thanks, the new government? Everyone will have a chance to respond, but is that directed at any of the panelists I should have said? Not specifically, but... Fantastic. but Thank you. Then, Dylan, if we can go to Ronan and then to the back of the room, then and um, concise as we can manage. Uh, Ronan Townen. Um, uh, first of all, I found this the most heartening presentation because uh, the idea of seizing Russian sovereign assets, the currencies, as our distinguished speaker from Australia uh, or based in Australia, made the point that is the largest uh, uh, available to compensate Ukraine for its destruction. And I'm very interested to know the status of the EU's attempts to seize those assets because I was quite shocked. It's not something I've not, not done any research on, but I was interested in doing research for this 
reason, because I understand the European Central Bank, believe it or believe it not, raised an objection to seizing Russian sovereign assets because it would undermine the bank's efforts to secure the establishment of the euro as a reserve currency. And the final question to the Nobel laureate, because she made a very good point there about finding universal applicable solutions to this that would be available to every uh, other peoples in this situation. And it's something I must say this conversation has uh, made me think about now for the first time about how dictators who violate the human rights of their own citizens and the ability to seize their assets to compensate their citizens where it cannot be done within their jurisdiction. For example, recently the case in the United States. Yeah, Rob, oh, Bruno, sorry. I, yeah, well, fair enough. Yeah, Thanks, stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Dylan, we have one last question uh, at the back of the room. This is a lot for the panellists. We appreciate it very much, but you'll each get a chance to respond to the three questions. All the way at the back. And if you could just give an affiliation name, you have one. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vivian Cook. I'm a grateful visitor to the Institute. Um, the panel ha have made a compelling case um, for the obligation uh, uh, for Russia to pay compensation and outlined some mechanisms by which that can be achieved. But I was wondering, um, do they feel if there's any benefit or, or even need um, for Russia to uh, admit or acknowledge its liability to pay that, case, uh, to pay that compensation? In other words, to, to admit that um, it's wrongdoings in, in the war. Thank you very much uh, for that, Vivian. I'm going to go back to the panelists. Thank you, Dylan, in reverse order. So I'm going to start with Anton M, and then to Gunter, then to the minister, and then to Alexandra. So over to you, Anton. Yeah, thanks for that. So uh, first question, how far does one go? Interestingly, I don't think it really arises in the context of frozen um, central bank reserves, because they're frozen, they're already unavailable to the Russian government. They can't be used to uh, support the ruble. They can't be used to carry out any uh, monetary policy operations. And so from the standpoint of Russia, whether those assets remain permanently frozen or confiscated for Ukraine's benefit is kind of a distinction without a difference. Either way, they won't have access to that property. Um, so I think that, that doesn't really give rise to any particular questions of hardship that might ensue for the Russian population. If we go beyond that and we have a further discussion about reparations, then I think there might be a consideration there of what the consequences for the Russian economy would be of that. Um, on the EU's attempts, uh, the EU has chosen a curious halfway house in its current approach to frozen um, securities and cash owned by the Russian Central Bank. And they said, look, we're going to leave the bulk of it untouched, but we're going to confiscate the interest that is being accrued on those assets. Um, it's a really interesting position because it still engenders all the same fundamental legal questions. You know, it's still the property of the Russian state, so what's the legal basis for that? You still need to articulate that, but the amount involved will be much smaller. So I think there's just a policy reason there. You know, that's me speculating, but probably if not going quite as far as one might have. Uh, but I think it's a pretty, to be honest, and satisfactory halfway house. Um, and then the third question was on the benefits of Russia admitting its obligation to pay reparations. Uh, look, I think uh, maybe not necessarily from a legal standpoint, uh, Russia has the obligation already, whether or not it admits it, but from a policy standpoint, uh, I think the difference would be immense. I think uh, lots, of, lots of countries would breathe out a sigh of relief and say, okay, well, now we know what we need to do. Um, until then, they, they might hesitate quite a bit more. Thank you so much, Anton. Very clear. Uh, you're invited to answer each question, but you can focus on one or two if you wish. But thank you for answering the three of them, Anton. Gunter. Yeah, well, as a German or former German that lived in France for 30 years, uh, the question of reparations can also do damage. It's, it's true. 1918 yeah. was, uh, you know, helped uh, enormous reparations help bring the Nazis to power. And you know what happened after that. But uh, the case of Russia is different. Russia is a very rich country with lots of oil and gas revenue, more comparable to Iraq. Iraq has many problems, but lack of oil and gas revenue because they paid a percentage to compensate Kuwait, it's not one of them. It can be done in a way that it will not ruin Russia. It mm. will not create more political prob problems uh, uh, as it did in, in the early, early 20th century. Uh, the admission of the, the need to pay reparations, that is, what we should really strive for in the long term, if we don't want to be once again one of the neighbors of Russia, uh, victims of another aggression. Uh, 
it's only with uh, with the understanding of of the those who will then represent the people of Russia that this was wrong, so wrong that it has to be compensated, that uh, we can be hoping for uh, lasting peace and uh, possibility to reduce uh, again our, our defense uh, expenses. For the European Central Bank, uh, I uh, really don't uh, agree with this, uh, uh, this warning because it is in the nature of having foreign reserves that you want to be part of, of world trade and uh, foreign reserves are needed in order to, to, to export and import uh, without the fluctuations of your own currency. And if the Euro is a reserve currency like the dollar, uh, then why, why should the Euro become the safe haven for, for the dictators and aggressors of the world when the dollar isn't? I mean, that would be a very bad advertisement for the Euro and don't mm. th I don't think it would help uh, make the euro more credible as a reserve currency. That's all. Thanks so much, Gunter. Minister Mudra, and ultimately. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Very, very interesting questions. Uh, if we speak about, if, well, about classical reparations and look into the history, most of the reparations were paid not by money, not with money, but by goods, production, facilities, techniques. Uh, so, um, well, which means that uh, in any case, Ukraine will have to find money somewhere to rebuild the country. And uh, the, those victims, uh, uh, we will have to, to, to have their source for paying compensation to the victims, either from our budget or from, I mean, financial support of, of our uh, uh, partners. But if to speak about reparations first, we have to have a defeated state or capitulation or a peace uh, treaty. We can't speak that it, it, is, it will be possible, definitely not with this leadership, definitely. How much time will it take when the, the, the leadership will change and, and uh, sit to the um, negotiation table, no one knows, but we badly need money now uh, for, for uh, reconstruction of infrastructure and for support of the uh, at least vul vulnerable ca categories of uh, people. And third, thirdly, reparations were paid decades. After the First wo uh, World War, it took how much? How many? 90 years mm. to repay reparations. Mm -hmm. World War, less. But mainly, it was uh, repaid by reparations were paid by by goods. The only state which made uh, which paid full reparations was uh, Finland after Finn um, USSR war in 1939. It took uh, like several years. They put uh, they paid uh, all three uh, hundred million. Um, as far as I remember correctly, uh, dollars. But it's um, well. It was it was a good uh, circumstances and a, a good uh, case when the Finland started to became a pro. Uh, they started to develop their themselves economically because of that. Because the support from European countries was enormous to rebuild, uh, to restart Finland uh, back to the econ economy, which means that if we want Russia to repay reparations, they will have to develop, they will have to be strong economically, they will have to continue their uh, export uh, transactions, they will have to, have to sell oil, gas, etc. So it means that we now want them to be uh, like um, developing more and more. Uh, that's why we don't see any any chance uh, as of today to to get reparations from them, and that's why we mainly uh, uh, we mainly concentrate on the compensation mechanism. Uh, so uh, whether the last question whether Russia uh, has to to provide consent to, compensa to compensation or to reparation? I think no. Uh, there is already an uh, international duty 
um, in line with the principle of uh, state responsibility. It is already uh, its, its responsibility. And moreover, it is acknowledged by the global community, by General Assembly uh, of United Nations. With regards to EU, I fully support the what, what has been uh, said uh, about uh, the concerns. And I don't think that these concerns uh, are there, there is reason. There are reasons for these concerns. Thank you very much, Minister. It's indicative of how important and good this panel is that everyone has stayed here beyond the allocated time. So it's a real thrill to listen to you. Possibly the last intervention to you, Alexandra, if you want to uh, pick up any of the questions that were put. I think we have to change our way of thinking because we still look into the world through the prism of Nuremberg trials, where Nazi war criminals were tried, but after Nazi regime had collapsed. We have assumed that Russia will refuse to pay ex gratia compensation, but this has not to be obstacle for us to find a way <clears throat> how to get this compensation. We have to be creative. The law is dynamic material. And answering your question, when I speak with my colleagues, human rights defenders from <laughs> Chechnya, from Georgia, from Mali, from Syria, from Libya, they're disappointed. They still struggling for justice, but a lot of them have no hope. We urgently need Ukrainian success. The success of Ukraine to demonstrate justice in meaning of bringing Putin and the political leadership and high military command of Russian state to justice the success of Ukraine, how to invent a new mechanism to get the compensation when Russia refused to pay it officially, will empower people in other countries and will make our world better. Feels like an appropriate point to which to conclude there's many things I would like to ask right back from the ambassador Grasco's presentation this morning with the the graphic but, but really seizing images and all of the remarks on the previous two panels um full of ideas and not completely without hope as well um, but much work to do and I just want to thank the panelists uh, from Australia to Dublin and everywhere in between. Thank you very much for your time. Um, the conversations will continue, but before that, I'm going to hand over to Alex White, our Director General, um, who's going to give some closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. And if the panelists just want to point themselves. And Smith, Legal Advisor, Department of Foreign Affairs, who chaired the first panel this afternoon. Um, and before, I'm not going to hold you much uh, longer. In case I forget, when I do finish, we would um, invite you to join us um, just for some refreshments. I think there's some left. I'm not sure if there's an awful lot left, but there's there's, a, there's something left. You certainly coffee down the back, um, at the, and we you know stay long for a few minutes if you have uh, the time, and we can just um, have some maybe informal conversation to wrap up the day. But before um, we conclude, um, I would like to invite Hannah Bazilo, who's the co-founder of Ukraine Action Ireland, to address you just with some closing remarks, Hannah. Thank you very much, uh, honorable panelists and uh, ambassadors and dear guests. Thank you very much for staying this long, both in person and online. It's my big honor to say a few concluding words on behalf of Ukrainian community in Ireland. Today, it's a community of almost 90,000 people and it's growing. And um, not everybody in this community is aware of uh, international law, of sophisticated legal language or procedures, but I can ensure you that there is not a single person whose heart is not bleeding from seeing and knowing about the crimes and horrors that were committed by Russia to our people. And Everybody knows that justice must be served. And today, as Alexandra mentioned, for everyone, justice means something different. And it's our duty to ensure that we cover it all. Uh, 
Ukrainian action in Ireland has organized many demonstrations and protests to raise awareness and to bring attention of Irish society and people in Ireland to the atrocities committed by Russia in Bucha, in Irpin, in Olenivka, Izum, Balaklia, Kherson. Unfortunately, there are too many people uh, who found protection from war in Ireland who were in occupation, who went through filtration, who has lost their family members, their homes, and who has nowhere to go back to. We have been planning this event with the embassy for many months. And we were trying to make sure that uh, we could bring together uh, the best speakers and the best panelists. And so that your messages could be heard to as many people in Ireland and globally as we could. And today, as we were following this exceptional discussion, I pointed out for myself three most important things. First of all, it, current process is a history in making, and it's basically uh, the future of international legal order is being decided right now. Secondly, um, we understood all that it's as much legal process as it's now about a political decision. So basically, if we really want to change something, it's in the hands of our political leadership. Finally, there is a fear of having a precedent uh, that can ruin something that we are so uh, used to, right? And everybody is uh, very afraid of getting out of the comfort zones. But I think that Ukraine and Ukrainian people has shown a very good example that sometimes it's important to be brave and stood up and not to fear. I believe we have succeeded in an excellent event and I am extremely grateful to the team of the International of the Institute for International and European Affairs, who have uh, done an excellent job hosting us here, organizing online discussion, bringing up so many amazing people to this um, discussion, and of course our partners and supporters from the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs uh, and the U.S. Embassy uh, to Ireland. Every liberated city and territory in Ukraine uh, brings up in us two feelings. It's immense joy and tears of happiness that territories and people are liberated, that the, our flag is, can be uh, waved there and people can speak Ukrainian language. But it also brings up tragedy and a deep, deep sadness of seeing what Russian occupants have committed to the people. And the mission of our organization is to be the voice and actions for Ukrainians in Ireland. And as long as Russia has its steps and ha has our territories as in, in our territories, and this war is going on, we will be doing our best to keep Ukraine high on the agenda in Ireland and to remind everybody that freedom cannot be taken for granted. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And um, Deputy Minister, uh, Ambassador, um, your uh, colleague, members of the Diplomatic Corps, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for um, being here this afternoon um, at this really important um, event um, with the agenda of ensuring that perpetrators of international crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine are held to account and that the victims are compensated for their loss and suffering. As Hannah mentioned, the 91,000 Ukrainians um, here in Ireland, each of them has his or her own experience of the impact um, of Russia's illegal war and of the terrible atrocities committed by Russia in Ukraine. And we saw some of those atrocities documented on our screen uh, with our own eyes at the beginning of this event. And the discussion, discussions then recognized first and foremost those individuals whose experiences were so starkly documented. But the discussion draws us all in 
everyone in Ukraine, self-evidently, but people all across the world, everyone who believes in the rule of law, mm -hmm. the rules-based multilateral order, and ultimately um, the principle that might does not make right. And these are the principles and the values that the IIEA regards as of fundamental importance to our mission. Just this morning, um, and we've had a long day, um, but a very fruitful day, but just this morning, quite early, we were hosting an event on the EU State of the Union and Mrs. van der Leyen's um, address to the European Parliament, including the issue of the European Union's uh, um, uh, objective of seeking justice for Ukraine. Only yesterday afternoon, we hosted an event with the founder of Bellingcat, Elliot Higgins, discussing the work of his organization and how they are using technology and open source investigations to collect evidence to hold perpetrators of international crimes to account. Our first panel this afternoon dealt with how we can hold perpetrators uh, of those crimes to account. And we heard about the options, the various instruments, legal instruments that are there and the ways in which Russia's crime of aggression can be prosecuted. And these are issues that are not devoid of complexity um, or even disagreement, perhaps even amongst, amongst lawyers and people who practice in the field. And I think the discussion was informed at least to some extent by a debate about whether the existing institutions are in fact adequate to the task or whether there's a need for, as some have advocated like Philippe Sands and others, that there needed to be, and I know that informed much of the discussion in the first panel, a special tribunal. So then, so there is this discussion, and I'm sure we'll all hope that it doesn't end up being a lengthy discussion that's, that, that it presents or offers an excuse for inaction, but in fact that, you know, action is taken. But they are issues that are um, uh, complex in, 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 ma in many ways. And I think as, as point has been made just in the last few minutes, that to a very considerable extent, it goes to the political will, it goes to the existence or otherwise of the political will on behalf of um, uh, states to push forward with um, this agenda. And we've seen failures historically, but we've also seen successes historically. And we must remind ourselves of that, that we have seen aggressive conduct pursued by the international community and pursued effectively. So we, while we can uh, think of and reflect on where there have been failures, we have to, um, I think, reflect also on the fact that when there is a resolute uh, uh, approach um, to this critical question, that um, uh, um, good outcomes can, uh, can ensue. In the second panel, we heard of how victims of Russian uh, aggression can be compensated for the pain and suffering caused by Russia's crime of aggression and the ongoing prosecution of its war. So I think the two panels together, and very well chosen and very well um, set, uh, set out in terms of the, um, the, the variety of issues that had to be addressed, presented a pathway to ensuring that those who commit international crimes, whether individuals or as state actors, uh, do not go unpunished. And that was much of the discussion in the last half hour was in relation to Russia itself, the state, and what can be done in terms of uh, levying uh, uh, um, against uh, the, 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 that, that state and what the options might be there. And a very interesting discussion, which I know could have continued for much longer. And the panelists themselves were enthusiastic to qu question each other. And that's always an indication of a, a very interesting debate and a very important debate. And I'm sure it's one that will continue. It's not beyond our capacity. It is not beyond the capacity of the international community and is not beyond, beyond the capacity of the international legal order for these questions to be addressed and, and to be addressed properly. I want to thank our partners, um, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Embassy of the United States and the Embassy of Ukraine, and of course, Ukraine Action, all of whom have made this event possible and all of whom uh, will continue, I know, the important work which was discussed in the course of this event. It's not going to be the end of our attention in the IAA to this question, nor I'm sure of any of our partners. Um, each day, new crimes are committed, but each day, too, dedicated and passionate people, including Hannah and so many others, uh, dedicate themselves to ensuring that victims of crimes are not denied justice, are not forgotten, no matter how long that takes. And similarly, the global community must stand up against wanton aggression and against 
this um, uh, violence and, uh, and force and not allow that to dictate the uh, um, international order. Um, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation, for your questions, your observations. Um, I, I know that it has really deepened uh, the discussion. Panelists are, are, can, can uh, come from their area of expertise and give us insights, make their observations. But what's really important for us always at the IAA is to have a, an intelligent listening and participating audience. And certainly that's what we had this afternoon. So once again, thank you all very much for your attention. We see you all again soon.